So, first, so firstly, I, I would like to begin by thanking you for The Happiness Hypothesis. Uh, yeah. It is a book that practically everybody I know now has read. So, uh, so it was a common fixture the moment I told everybody that, uh, you know, I was interviewing you. I had a whole list of questions uh, from my mom who's studying counseling uh, mm -hmm. now as she's kind of doing a career switch and she just loves your book and, and two friends, right? So, so I have a long list of questions and I think a lot of it will probably begin with uh, my favorite question, which is your story. I'd love mm -hmm. to understand why you do what you do uh, and mm -hmm. how you got here with, you know, an understanding of what the defining moments were. I mean, I, I've, I've, yeah. I've, when I looked at your research thesis, I'm sure there's a some sort of squiggly line that connects them all. And mm -hmm. I'd, I'd love to understand that, that story. Right. Okay, okay, sure. sure. Uh, uh, well, well, I'll try, try to, go to go for the, the short, short to medium, medium length, length story rather than the long, long one. one. That would help. Uh, which, <laughs> which is that uh, I've, I've always wanted, wanted to be a scientist because I just love figuring things out. out. And that was always my great pleasure. And there's a line from Joseph Campbell, a man who studied mythology decades ago, advised everyone to figure out what mythological character you are. And I was not, my if I was in mythology, I would not be the king or the joker or the princess or prince i would be the explorer i just always wanted to go everywhere and learn everything okay um and uh once i when i was in college i thought i would be a scientist probably a doctor doing biomedical research but it turned out that organic chemistry was so boring and everyone hated being there and i just i just viscerally couldn't stand it uh, so i left i left that track i started writing computer programs just to make a living after college, uh, worked, worked for the U.S. government, government decided, decided I wanted to go to grad school, school thought, what should I go in? in? Well, I studied philosophy, I studied psychology, um, I, I worked, worked in computers, so maybe artificial intelligence. intelligence. So, so I started, started applying to grad school, school in computer science. science. And, and that, that also felt kind of weird and, and the people didn't feel right. And I ended up just on a whim. I stopped into the psychology department at Penn. Uh, and, and everything, everything felt right. right. And, and I, I talked with people who were really human, and uh, there were plants in the lobby and carpeting, and, and people, people seemed to be happy, so I applied to psychology. psychology. I, I ended up studying morality. morality. Yes. Uh, and, and that's, that's what I've done ever since. I love my topic. It, it allows me to go everywhere. everywhere. I've, I've, I've applied morality uh, to politics in recent years. years. Now yes. I'm at the Stern School of Business. I'm using morality to study business, business ethics. When, when I got, I got to UVA, UVA, though, the University of Virginia, Virginia my first teaching job, job, I was assigned to teach Psych 101, the introductory psychology class. Mm -hmm. And that forced me to learn about all the areas of psychology well enough to teach them, which is the kind of challenge I love, because I love, I love just like immersing myself into complicated, in complicated sets of, of material, and then just you, you stick your head deep enough into it, you sort of shake your head around, and after a while, it all falls into place. So... So, so I did, I did that, that with Psych 101, and in the process, process of explaining all of psychology, uh, I found myself quoted from the ancients a lot, mm -hmm. and thus was born the idea for the happiness hypothesis. I thought, if I don't get tenure, and it looks for a while, so so I get tenure, and I have to leave, you, you leave UVA, if I don't get tenure, I'll try to write this trade book, and maybe it can make some money, and maybe I can support myself as a writer. Um, uh, well, it well, turns out I did get tenure, tenure and I got to stay at UVA, UVA but I thought, I thought, I thought well, that book idea, that sounds pretty fun. fun. Why don't I do it anyway? Uh, so so I, I spent a couple of years, and I, I read all kinds of ancient sources, and I just wrote down, down every time I found a psychological insight, I would write it down, and I had a long, long list. I would put them in different categories, and then I basically wrote 10 essays around 10 clusters of great ideas. So so the next question is, you know, you've mentioned your research went from all the way from Machiavelli to uh, to Hindu scriptures, etc. So most of the stuff, at least the Hindu scripture part, is pretty cryptic. Uh, how did you uh, how did you manage to get your way around it? And and I would imagine you probably did uh, say in again. I I know this part, so I can say you you probably did English translations of Sanskrit, oh, yes. and that would have already made it even more cryptic. How how did you how did you get around that? Well, um, <clears throat> ancient sources vary a lot in how intelligible they are. Yeah. And uh, so sources from the West were easier for me, of course, than sources from the East. Yeah. Uh, sources written after about four or 500 B.C. are easier than sources written before 700 B.C. Everything before, six, everything before the Axial Age, everything before six or 700 is much more cryptic uh, than things written afterwards. Um, and so I read some of the Upanishads, the Vedas, and they were very, very difficult. So I didn't 
there I didn't really rely on my own reading. I didn't just, I couldn't take something and just read a few pages around it. So there I did, if I remember correctly, I found other lists of wisdom from the Vedas and I only had a couple from, from uh, ancient, uh, uh, ancient India. Uh, that was harder. Um, but, oh, but actually the Bhagavad Gita, now that is much more recent. Yes, yes, that I yes. I found brilliant, and that I found much more intelligible. And that deals with the, the basic dilemma, or not the dilemma, the basic situation of a person reacting so strongly to success and failure. Yeah. And that channel, the, if you had to say, what is the basic wisdom of the East? It is that. It is that the world is to some extent an illusion of your making. Yeah. You're the one who's reading on all the... All the extreme reacting, you know, the, the things that make you react so extremely. So the Bhagavad Gita, because it also because it's part of it's part of the epics. Now the epics are stories. Stories are always intelligible. That's what's so amazing. Stories you can hear a story from thousands of years ago and you can totally understand it. Yeah. Whereas religious writings, that those are much much more difficult sometimes. Got it. So so the next bunch of questions is is is, is to start with happiness, right? And it's uh, the first one is I think directly to the end. You say you use. You sum it up with the word the be- between. Uh, yeah. what, what, what could you could you t- could you talk talk me through through that and and how it happened and and what that means to you? Sure. So uh, the original title for the book, when I proposed it to the publishers, was 12 Great Truths: Insights into Mind and Heart from Ancient Cultures and Modern Psychology." Okay. And that's exactly what the book is about. Yes. But it's not a very good title. Yes. So. <clears throat> Um, uh, so actually, and then I, by the time I turned it in, it had turned into 10 great truths inside the because I kind of ran out of time and I had to just, I figured 10 was better than 12. Okay. Uh, so I turned in the first version of the manuscript <clears throat> and the publisher said, well, we don't like that title. How about the happiness hypothesis? Okay. You know, it kind of gets at the idea that it's science, it's a hypothesis, but it's also about happiness. And I said, well... Uh, first of all, the book isn't about happiness primarily. I mean, there's a lot of happiness stuff in it, but it's about all sorts of things. And secondly, I don't know what the happiness hypothesis is. Yeah. I mean, what if someone asks me, what is it? Um, but as I was revising the book, I realized, well, actually, there are a couple different hypotheses. The simplest one is happiness comes from getting what you want. Yeah. And that's the one which is very easy to say no. I mean, we feel relief, we feel happy briefly, but the next day, it's like it's over. So it's easy to dismiss that one based on research and our own introspection. The second version of the hypothesis, uh, which is the one that you find all over the ancient world, is that happiness comes from within. Uh, And this, again, is the wisdom of the East and also of the Stoics in ancient Greece. And that's what makes it a great truth. You cannot control the world. You You cannot make the world conform to your liking. Therefore, work on yourself. If you can get yourself right, that's the way to achieve happiness. Well, that's a lot wiser, a lot deeper, that's a lot more inspiring, and that's what I found in many, many places. That's a great truth. Uh, But the conclusion I came to by the end of the book um, was that it is not right, Um, or at least I should say it is not right, certainly for Westerners who live in a very, very safe world, in which you actually can plan for the future, you can control many aspects of your environment, and the possibility of a heroic life in which you make a big difference to the world is really open to you. Mm. So, so I decided that um, the advice from the East about getting some distance and not reacting so strongly, I mean, that, that might be good for a much older man or woman, but that there is something really, not just noble, but it's living life to the fullest to really strive Throw yourself in, try to make a difference, especially when you're younger. And what I realized is that so much of modern psychology tells us that the key to happiness is love and work. That's what Freud said, and I think that's one of the few areas where he was really right. Um, uh, love and work, and the essence of love and work is about the, your degree of connection or indebtedness. So love isn't just, oh, I love you, baby, so much. Oh, 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 let's get married. Love is the nature of your your connection and embeddedness with others. Um, um, uh, Companionate love is more important in the long run than passionate love. So if you get the right kind of connection between yourself and many others, that's the best you can do in terms of, of, of feeling that you are part of 
uh, a social network. For work turns out to actually be very similar. Work isn't just about achieving something. The key idea, um, uh, the key idea was, um, let's see, I just, I forget the, tech, the technical word here. It's, I describe it in detail in uh, chapter 10, is vital engagement. Is, it, is that the term used by Mihai Chicks at Mihai? Yes, flow, right, uh, yeah. And, and, and as I came to understand that concept of vital engagement, of, of immersing yourself in something so you learn about it more and more, you become part of a community of people who are working at something, it, it seems so similar to love that I realized, well, that's really the key. It, it's not causing a change in the world, which leads to happiness. It's getting embedded in the right way with other people and with, with your work. And once I saw that, I realized, hey, that's the happiness hypothesis. Number three is happiness comes from between. There you go. Okay, because what I was wondering was, I was wondering if there was sort of a Viktor Frankl influence to it, right? Because uh, Viktor Frankl's thesis was, you know, it comes from the pursuit. Uh, you know, life's, he, he believed entirely in the pursuit and, and, and pretty much not everything else. And I thought he had a fair claim uh, given what he went to went through. So, so I was just wondering what the what the what the influence was. But, but, That's right. Uh, yeah. yeah, I read I read Frankel when I was in college. I loved it, uh, but I kind of forgot about the book while I was writing. I should have reread it. Okay. It certainly is a book full of wisdom. Uh, but the fact that he puts it that way indicates um, uh, indicates again that it's a great truth. Uh, I think she, I have a quote from Shakespeare somewhere in the book. Uh, joy's soul lies in the doing, something like mm. that. Um, it's not the achievement, it's the doing. And, and there's a lot of scientific support for that, that our brains get more pleasure from making progress towards a goal than, than from actually achieving the goal and shutting it off. Fair enough. So so the next next one is, there is a particular line, and I'm, I may be quoting it uh, probably hopefully near correct, but it's happiness is the state of the human being that has achieved cross-level co coherence between herself the people, challenges, and institutions around her. Now, mm -hmm. when I read this, one of the thoughts that came to mind is, is this is this integrity? Are we talking about, mm -hmm. you know, in, in Stephen Covey mm -hmm. uh, brought up integrity as, you know, in, in, from integer meaning whole, and it mm -hmm. meant coherence on every level, and he connected it to making and keeping commitments to his first, you know, be proactive uh, idea. So I was just wondering yeah. whether there was whether that was a thought that crossed your mind or, or was it something? Yeah, no, it's not a thought that crossed my mind, but I think it's a good one. Uh, the idea of cross-level coherence—I think it's the hardest idea in the whole book—and uh, it it basically refers to the fact that we exist on three levels. We are psychological creatures who have experiences, of course, uh, but um, we also are physical creatures that have an embodiment. We we move in certain ways. Our culture makes us feel physical the physical world in certain ways and so when your uh, when your psychology and your physical embodiment really mesh up and then we're cultural creatures we live in a world of stories and, and history and institutions when all of that matches up at, at multiple levels that's cross-level coherence mm. and some things begin to feel right mm. now that is not the same thing i would say as moral integrity or personal integrity mm. but i think integrity um integrity i mean the word literally means you know linking together right. integral yeah um I think it is the same idea that that things that could come apart, and of yeah. course, people's behavior and values can come apart. Yeah. When a person has that kind of coherence between word and deed and what they really want inside, yeah. I think we, we see that in others, and it, it we do recognize it as a kind of integrity. So I yeah. think they're at least analogous, if not homologous. Yeah. yeah. No. And yeah. Fair enough. So 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 I so so here's the next one. Uh, why, okay. why, why? Firstly, why do we do things that we know are bad for us? And of course, there's the there's the rider uh, and elephant aspect right. to it. But but more importantly, why is it so hard to sustain a good habit? Uh, and, yeah. and 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 that's like so you can of course say that we fight the elephant's resistance when we go to the gym on the first day. But we walk mm -hmm. out of the first day feeling good. But yet, if we get a chance on the thirtieth day to break that habit, it feels like we would. Uh, why is it so hard? Um, well, the 30th day, let's see, the research shows that it takes 10 to 12 weeks for a habit to stick. Fair enough. So, 12 times 7, wait until about day 80, 85, and, uh, and at that point, it'll be much, you won't be so tempted. So, for those who haven't read the book, uh, the foundational metaphor of the book is probably the foundational metaphor of so much of, of ancient wisdom, which is that the mind is divided into parts that sometimes conflict. Yes. And... 
uh, this is the idea you find in every civilization that has writing. Yes. I'll just express it. Uh, there's a, a, a quote that I use, a quote from Ovid. Um, I see the right way and approve it. Alas, I follow the wrong. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Ben Franklin said, if passion drives, let reason hold the reins. Yes. Just so many ideas that were divided into parts. And uh, the way that I, and Plato, many others give us the metaphor that the mind is like a, a, a sure. charioteer driving a horse. Sure. Yeah. So a, a man on a horse is a very common metaphor. Um, I honestly don't know whether I took the metaphor of a rider on an elephant from Buddha. I probably did without realizing it. Uh, but Buddha just talks about um, uh, meditation and culti self-cultivation as being like taming or training an elephant. That's a much better metaphor because an elephant is much bigger than a horse, much smarter, very, very sociable. Um, so why do we do the right, why do we, you know, see, uh, see the right way and prove it, uh, but yet follow the wrong? Because our behavior is governed primarily by the elephant, but our conscious thinking is the rider. Mm. And our conscious thinking is not in control of our behavior. We are animals like other animals. Our uh, motivational centers are not our language centers. Our language centers evolved very, very recently in the last half million years. So our language is like an advisor. Uh, we can think, we can plan, and we, if we have a lot of self-control, we can make ourselves do something for a while. Yeah. But in the long run, if you don't change the elephant, in the long run, you're likely to fail. Hmm. So that's the explanation. Fair enough. And, and you know, I can see a complete tie-in with willpower and habit here, right? So you know, Exactly. You, yeah, that's it's, right. It's, that's it's, right. It's, that work on willpower is crucial for this. Yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so the next one is the uh, is how have these studies changed your life? Uh, I, 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 and and I had an interesting answer from Roy Baumeister on this. He said, you know, I study for the sake uh, for for the for the joy of studying. It's not because I feel they changed my life. So I'm I'm curious to understand what your motivations were and what the end result has been. Are you happier? Yeah. My, my mom even I think specifically had a question. She said, can you ask him what his happiness is one to ten? Which I thought was funny. Uh, but 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 I just thought you know it would be interesting to get your view. <clears throat> Yeah. So I think I was born um, you know, on the happiness spectrum. I'm around average or maybe just a little above average. Okay. Um, so, you know, like most people, if my life is going well and if I'm well embedded, then I'm a happy person. But I've had periods that were uh, not exactly depression, but certainly anxiety and um, just not not enjoying life. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's hard to say how the book affected me because lots of things changed at the same time. I had a few years and I talk about it in the book. When I was an assistant professor yeah. and I was single, I was alone. I didn't know if I had a secure future in the academic world. Um, those were the worst years of my life. And I was, you know, if happiness comes from between, I was pretty separate. Um, and then all around the same time, I got tenure. I met the woman who became my wife. She had a wonderful little dog. And that, you know, that dog, Andy, became part of my life. Um, and uh, I was much more secure in my work. Uh, so my life has been really good since then. Um, uh, I guess I would say that writing the book has um, has greatly satisfied the philosophical um, urges and and, and uh, yearnings that I had in my child, in my teen years, and in my twenties. And I sort of forgot those for a while when I became a, a social psychologist. But it really allowed me to satisfy uh, things that I've just have always been so interested in. As for how it changes my behavior. Um, I don't think it changes my behavior very much directly because, again, what you know doesn't necessarily change your behavior. Yes. Um, but it's really helped me to understand um, love and to give better – now, I fell in love and got married as I was just before writing the book. But it's allowed me to give much better advice to friends who are you know, falling in love and doing crazy things. Um, it's allowed me to make much better apologies. Um, chapter 4 on the faults of others. I still say stupid things, but now I'm really – really good at apologizing like i know you know i i know how self-righteousness works i know when i'm self-righteous i can see it in others so even though i still say stupid things um i i uh can make excellent apologies and get myself out of trouble much better than i used to because in the past if i said something stupid i would then try to defend myself and now i don't uh so it's interesting so i have i i finally got a date with daniel really uh in two months 
uh, oh, but good. after you finish reading it, it's amazing how once you read your i mean his books on irrationality you you yeah. can't take yourself seriously right it's just it's just it's just That's very right. very hard so but but you also speak of little habits like like you know counting blessings was one of those you mentioned mm-hmm. the other one you mentioned was journaling um, you know mm-hmm. writing down uh, writing down forgiving and forgiving people uh, how much mm-hmm. of these have you have you have uh, have you done yourself or have you relied on research or have you seen, have you recommended right. to others? What, what's no, been the nothing? I've never, I've never done them. Okay. Um, in part because I don't think I, I didn't know about them back when I was depressed or anxious. <laughs> um, back then, you know, I tried, I experimented with smart drugs and St. Yes. John's wort and Prozac and, um, you know, so I, I went for the quick fix because <laughs> I was so busy, you know, trying to do my research to get tenure. Um, so I would, I would have an experimental approach to life. Yeah. Had I known about those things back then, this yeah. was in the mid-90s, late yeah. 90s, I would have done them. Uh, but those were only published uh, around 2002, 2003, yes. that I think those results began to come out. Okay. Um, so again, it's, uh, I've been very fortunate that while I, you know, actually I've been fortunate that I went through some tough years because that has allowed me to appreciate just how, how fortunate I am now to be so well embedded I have I, I UVA was wonderful, but now I, I have an, uh, an amazing job at New York University. I get to live in New York City, which is spectacular these days. Um, I have two young children who are beautiful and healthy and so cute. Um, so if your was your mother wanted to know where I am on a scale of one to ten, uh, these days I guess I, I'd have to say ten, even <laughs> though my normal my normal position is about seven or eight. Yeah. Um, but especially since moving to New York and having the excitement of of a you know, I, mean, I love learning new things, and I'm I'm in this new environment, so things are pretty fun these days. That, no, that's great. And you also met. You, I mean, the, I guess a, uh, one of the big parts of, of of the book was also the impact the impact of adversity on on long term happiness, right? So, mm-hmm. so, right. so, so I'm sure that helped. So, you know, I promised 20 minutes. I'm, I know I'm just getting across, but I have, I have a final couple of questions. Should be pretty quick. One of them is uh, this is actually purely on um on a Sort of productivity basis. So you know, you're 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 obviously have been extremely productive all through. And I love asking, you know, are there any little hacks, trip tips, things, you know, habits, sure. routines that you you run to 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 be productive? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the first is know your body, know your energy cycle, um, and the the habits. So writing these two books, Happiness Hypothesis and Righteous Mind. Yes. Uh, I mean, writing a book takes you know thousands of hours. And you have to stick that into a busy life. And the only way you can do that is to get the most out of yourself and also to push back all other obligations. Mm -hmm. So uh, know your body. And for me, what that meant was um, uh, writing in the morning. I didn't know that. I I thought that I was an evening person. So to discover that actually, if I get up two hours early, if I get up at five or six in the morning, write for a little bit, then have breakfast, then write a little longer, and then you're done for the day by lunchtime. Uh, after lunch, you can have meetings with people, you can return phone calls, you can do email, and then do the reading later on to feed tomorrow's elephant, not elephant, but to feed, you know, do the reading at night so that the next morning you'll have the ideas in your head to work on. Um, uh, another is um, you've got to be really brutal about saying no. I used to have a quote on my wall, something like you've got to decide uh, what it is that's important and then say no, uh, say no to others politely, firmly, non-apologetically, something like that. Um, So I I would use Google uh, or Gmail's canned messages to respond when, you know, so many requests. I mean, you you can't, you just can't fulfill all the things that are asked of you. So if you say no, if you say no, but in a funny way, I actually got more praise. I had a bounce message and I got more praise over that than anything else I've ever written because everybody recognizes the situation of just you, you can't you can't you have to say no yeah um so that would be it know your energy cycle and your productivity habits and be firm but funny if possible uh, about saying no so that you carve out the large blocks of time on consecutive days that are necessary to do something creative hmm. uh you know you know i haven't read the righteous mind yet I, I have it on my reading list so you know i might just reach out with an interview li- uh, request next year no, i'm kidding <laughs> You're, you're, you're a very fun, uh, enthusiastic <laughs> interviewer. It's fun talking with you. No, so, so, so my final question, Don, is what is an idea that inspires you that you would like to share? What... 
an idea that inspires me. I think maybe I'll share two of them with you. Mm -hmm. One that I learned, I don't think I put it in the book, but I, I came to think about it after writing the book, um, is that we talk a lot, most people often talk a lot about balance, the importance of balance. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> I feel like I've, I've gone through a kind of a, the rapids, um, you know, in writing these books, and then there's a lot of press exposure, especially on the, on the Righteous Mind. Yeah. Um, my life has been very unbalanced for much of it. Yeah. And what I'm coming to see is that uh, while balance is a value in a life overall, perhaps, probably, uh, but one should not strive for balance at every point in his or her life, that some periods of extreme imbalance uh, can be both beneficial in terms of allowing you to make a contribution to do something beyond what you thought you could do, um, and it just makes your life more exciting. Now, it can't go on forever. You burn out. But um, I would urge people uh, to, to do something great by, if necessary, distorting your life, living in a very unbalanced way. You can't keep it up for years, but for brief periods of time or maybe even a year or two, um, go for it. You really, it, you, you, in the long run, you may actually be happier um, going through some hardship and some imbalance. That's the first. Uh, the second um, is, and this is more about my newer book, is that we are all such flawed, hypocritical, biased creatures uh, that once you come to see that, once you come to understand moral psychology, it makes you more modest and it makes you angry much less often. I hardly ever get angry. Um, I used to, I spent the 1980s angry at Ronald Reagan and Republicans. Uh, I, I've been angry, you know, I'm, I'm probably sort of type A, you know, pushy New York Jewish guy. Uh, I used to get angry a lot, but since doing this research, I think that's one way that, that that's, the work has changed me. Um, I just try, I find it so fascinating to understand people and why they believe the things they believe that I, I just, I don't get angry that much anymore. So I think that moral psychology has the potential to liberate us from uh, these moralistic judgments, uh, which of course is something that Buddhism promises and delivers as well. When you, and it, for many of the same reasons, you, you know, Buddhist, Buddha was all about uh, understand your limits, under, you know, be, be more humble, uh, understand that we all are operating within the veil of Maya, within the veil of illusion. And if you do that, how can you get mad at people? Oh, that's brilliant. I mean, it's so, it resonates. I and mean, I would love to, so the first, on, on your first one, I, I always thought, there's so much ancient wisdom on everything, everything in moderation, and and it naturally leads to even moderation should be in moderation, right? So, exactly. So that's right. There are times in life for throwing moderation to the to the wind. That's no, right. I, I agree and and completely agree on on modern psycho on, on 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 psychology as such. It's it's for me what's amazing is it's enabled me to take myself so less uh, so much less seriously because mm -hmm. I I realize that you know I'm probably saying one thing, doing another, and then saying another thing again after that. So. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, you see, in my, you know, in the righteous mind, I catch myself lying to my wife, and I didn't even realize that I was lying to her until yeah. I went back to start writing about lying, and I was, oh my God, I just did that to my wife. So yeah, it can help you see. I mean, the, you know, it's amazing not just that we can tie our shoes in the morning. It's amazing that we can actually have a civilization which has relatively little violence. You know, if you if you look at it that way, it's kind of miraculous that things are going as well as they're going. Yeah, you know, and, and it's funny. I mean, there's a lot of talk about, oh, we're in such a bad time and dangerous time and all that. But I'm, I'm reading Ian Morris's book on uh, on why the West rules. It's a, it's a great treatise on, on history and why the, way, why the world is the way it is. And when you look at where we came from, I mean, we're living in an incredible time. And, and yeah. That's right. When you look, what, what really has changed me, I used to be somewhat pessimistic about the future. Yeah. But when I see the graphs of world poverty, world poverty is ending. Uh, I mean, not entirely, but extreme poverty is going close to zero over yes. the next 15, 20 years. Yes. It's not because of governments. It's not because of NGOs. It's because of business. It's because India and China have adopted free market capitalism, yes. and they are experiencing just what England and America did, only in a very, very compressed way. Yes. And when you think, oh, my God, poverty could actually end on this planet? What an incredible miracle. So if you look at rising wealth, declining poverty, declining violence, um, Things are getting amazingly good. Population will begin shrinking in the next century. Uh, it's going to be tough on the environment in the next 50 years. But I think that if we make it through that, the environment's going to get a lot better too. No, but and, and I, every time I do these, right, I'm sitting in the Southern Hemisphere in Buenos Aires. You are in the Northern Hemisphere in New York. And, you know, we're having a, just a seamless conversation with top quality 
I mean, it, it, it's like magic. It's just, uh, it's just an amazing time to be alive, I think. That's right. And the network effects of having ideas flow around the world instantly. There used to only be a few tens of millions of people involved in the promulgation of ideas. Now suddenly there's a billion, and in a few years there'll be you know, four or five billion who are actively involved. So I'm actually pretty optimistic these days. Ah, that's fantastic. No, thank you so much. Mm-hmm.